one. I'm going to give you 10 seconds, and then we're going to get going. Five. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Roy Christian Church. We're glad you've chosen to come and worship with us this morning. My name is James Sayers. I'm the pastor here. Uh, if you are watching online, um, as I know some of you are, uh, we'd love to have your comments today. Uh, you can find us, for those of you who don't know already, uh, you can find us on Facebook uh, under Roy Christian Church. Um, we, we do live streaming every Sunday, and uh, we also upload that to YouTube on, uh, on Monday morning. So find us, follow us, like us, subscribe to us, share us. Um, however uh, you'd like to do that, we'd be thrilled. Uh, if you are new to the church and have not yet texted the keyword hello uh, to the number on the screen, 385-217-8399, we ask that you just go ahead and do that right now. It's okay. You can, I'll let you play with your phones for this moment, right? Uh, if you're part of the church family, uh, you're one of the regulars here, and you have not yet sent the word loop, L-O-O-P, uh, to that number, uh, we'd love for you to do that as well right now, too. Uh, we want to keep everybody updated about events and news, 160 characters at a time. Um, so uh, there is a list in the bulletin of all of the keywords that will make magic happen on your cell phone. Um, so please go ahead uh, with that at some point soon. Uh, today we have three, maybe four campers going to Intermountain Christian Camp today. Um, uh, my son Cole and probably my daughter Cora are going to camp along with Maria, uh, Mariah Darling and uh, Cole's buddy Aiden. Uh, they'll be at high school camp this week, um, and they'll be back on Friday night. Uh, we had um, a, a group of Sayers at uh, junior camp last week. Uh, AJ was the real camper. The, everybody else was just staff. Um, they also had a great time. Anthony was there last week. Anthony Borelli uh, had a great time, too. Um, please be praying for our campers uh, for their travel on the 250-mile one-way trip. Uh, we'd appreciate that. If you still need to register for camp, you can uh, go to ICCFairfield.com uh, and you can use a coupon code um, of ROYCC2022, ROYCC2022, uh, and you won't have to pay anything just yet. Uh, there is a special potluck today after church uh, to mark 20 years of my relationship with Roy Christian Church. Uh, 20... Uh, 20 years ago today, me and the Penske truck rolled into Roy, uh, and um, uh, nothing has been the same for anybody since, so uh, thank you. Uh, there will not be a leadership team meeting today because of all the extra fe festivities. Um, you may be in a dessert coma, and we, we need to have our staff and leadership team on, on top of things, so. Uh, if you'd like to sign up for their newsletter, you can do that at roychristian.org, which is our website. Uh, you can fill out one of those connection cards that is in a chair pocket near you. Uh, there will be a spot you can put those on the, um, on the welcome desk, or if you can jam them into the offering box, you can do that too. Uh, you can also, on those cards, uh, share a prayer request um, with our prayer team, uh, or you can email prayer at roychristian.org. In the last few days, we've had the, uh, just a couple uh, to share. Hang on a second. I'm having a peanut butter problem. <clears throat> Joe and Starla Engel have asked for, for prayer for their daughter, Nikki. Uh, her cancer is back after having been in remission for a while. And Don Twitchell will have surgery um, in a couple weeks, July 7th, for, uh, for lung cancer. Um, I can't remember if we shared this last Sunday, but I had a conversation online with uh, a mom here in the area named Courtney. Uh, she and her husband have five kids, I think from about 12 years old down, uh, and he lost his job um, back in the middle of May as a software guy. Um, he's looking for work, and they need some relief from multiple struggles that they've been dealing with. So if you'd be uh, praying for Courtney and her family. Uh, we also uh, want to keep in mind um, 
uh, our friends, the captains um, from the Salt Christian Church uh, family. Um, heard from uh, Louie and Lisa this morning that they're going to be taking off um, in about four weeks from now, uh, heading back to Indiana. Uh, and then um, Josh and Hannah uh, will be taking off maybe before, maybe after. Uh, it'll probably depend on if they have a place to move into uh, once they get there. Uh, but Josh will be the new lead pastor at the Rockville Christian Church in Rockville, Indiana. Um, so uh, be praying for some housing to open up. Um, that's just the right uh, fit uh, for, uh, for all the generations of captains uh, here in the next few weeks. Let's take a minute to pray together, and then we'll, uh, we'll continue. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for the fact that we can come to you um, anytime we want, any place that we are, with anything that happens to be on our mind or in our, uh, in our thoughts and, and um, in our hearts. Uh, we're grateful, Lord, that we don't need to be in a special place and use specific words to address you, that we can just talk to you like we talk to a parent. Uh, we can talk to you like we talk to a friend. So, Lord, we, uh, we ask for these requests we've shared this morning that you would do just exactly the right thing at just the right time. Uh, we pray for these two families who are, uh, who are struggling um, with uh, cancer issues, that you would be so very near to them, that they would feel your presence, um, that they would know the peace that passes understanding that can only come from you. Lord, we pray um, for um, successful treatment uh, and, um, uh, and for lots and lots and lots of remission. Uh, we pray, Father, for, uh, for the captain families as they uh, anticipate their uh, move to Indiana, that you would grease the skids all the way there, um, that things would go smoothly and easily, that you would uh, provide um, the right uh, sort of home for them as they begin this new ministry there. Uh, we're grateful for, um, for our friends from Salt Christian Church that are, are worship, uh, worshiping with us this, um, this summer. Uh, we're so very glad to have them and all of our guests here with us this morning. Uh, we're, we're grateful for the grace that you have showered upon us. Uh, and we ask, Father, that we would be focused on your grace today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> if you'd like to give a gift or an offering, uh, we are not collecting those um, during the service. There's a couple of boxes just outside the doors here uh, where you can uh, drop your offering envelope. Those are available uh, in the chair pockets uh, somewhere near you. If you would like to share that way, uh, we appreciate what you, uh, what you give. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, if you don't own a Bible, that you will take one um, from the chair rack near you and just keep that. Uh, we, we want everybody to know what God's plan is for their lives, and that's the absolute best way uh, to, to figure out what that is. Uh, I, I will say, um, just kind of tucking my bulletin away, um, that there are several things in the bulletin and the newsletter this week that we're, we haven't discussed this morning. Um, Jen is off at the Hill Air, for, uh, Hill Air Show um, this morning again. Um, with a booth for the new preschool that we're launching uh, later this year. Um, I know um, there have been a lot of people who have supported that and have given toward it and have prayed about it. Uh, we, we hope that there would be many, many families from the community who would, uh, would see this opportunity to uh, get their, uh, their little bitty kids involved in um, some Bible-based, um, Jesus-focused uh, learning. Um, as well as several other things uh, in the, uh, the bulletin. Uh, we hope that you'll pick one of those up today. <clears throat> uh, over the last month and a half, we have been talking a lot about families uh, and the, um, the foundations of a healthy family. Uh, we, we've seen that healthy families put God first. Healthy families uh, pr provide for each other. Healthy families have conversations about God, and healthy families serve each other. We're going to wrap up this series this morning um, by recognizing that healthy families aren't stingy with grace. Healthy families aren't stingy with grace. Uh, every person in a family, spouses, parents, children, uh, everybody involved in the family needs to model God's grace in those closest relationships. And this morning, the, uh, 
uh, the sermon text comes from Ephesians chapter 5 uh, and verse 22 on down through chapter 6 verse 4. Um, Ephesians 5, 22, down through chapter 6, verse 4. Uh, let me read um, what Paul has to say there. Wives, submit to yourselves as uh, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church for we are members of his body for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh this is a profound mystery but I am talking about Christ and the church however each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. <clears throat> that text doesn't play in our society the way that it did 20 centuries ago. Uh, I, I know um, that as soon as some of those first words come out of my mouth, I can see female hackles going up and female arms crossing. And that look, guys, you know which look that is. Wives, submit to your husbands. Let me just make sure that you understand that right now, um, this, this message is not about all the ways that wives are failing to submit to their husbands because I'd like to celebrate another 20 years of ministry uh, at some point. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the best way to get run out on a, uh, on a rail. Um, what, what I'd like for us to focus on here um, is something that I hadn't really considered too much before is that um, in, in these verses, we really see um, more of a drive for the people in a home, the people in a family, to extend God's grace to everyone in the family. Now, it looks different for different members of the family, wives and husbands, parents and children, but I really think that it really has to all go back to or come down to grace. Um, I, I think uh, right at the beginning, we see an example of the best grace of God. Um, from, the, uh, from the outset, uh, the, the letter to the Ephesians really is about the fact that we are saved by grace, not through anything that we've done. It is by, uh, by God's grace that we are saved, um, period. We cannot earn it. We cannot buy it. We can't be good enough to get God's good favor. Um, but Paul also makes it, equally clear in this letter that God has made us, we're his, his workmanship, uh, and he has called us to do good works. That's uh, Ephesians 2.10. So in the last half of this letter, um, Paul gives some very specific um, exhortations about the kind of behavior that reflects our Christian faith. Uh, James talks about you. Uh, you have faith, I have deeds. You show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. Um, those two things, faith and action, have to be welded together for it to be authentic faith uh, in Jesus Christ. Um, we are to pattern our behavior after God himself. If we say that we believe in him, then that should be reflected in how we behave every day. In uh, Ephesians chapter 
5, uh, verse 1. Um, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What's the example? What Jesus did. Jesus, the only Son of God, seated at the right hand of the throne of God, gave all of it up to come down here to give us God's grace to bring forgiveness to us, to make it possible for us to have a relationship with him on this earth and in the life to follow. The imitation of God is a fundamental part of being a Christ follower. Yeah. So... um, Do you love or hate Facebook? Yes. Some days, some days we love Facebook because there's interesting posts about recipes or restaurants or class reunions or family photos that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise. And we love Facebook. But we also hate it because it brings up the absolute awfulest in most people. Um, we, we all seem to have this idea that because Facebook exists, the world is entitled to our opinion of everything. Right? Right. And all of those who didn't say right, you're liars. You know that you sometimes have to stop yourself from commenting on everything that you see. Delete, 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 delete. I'm just going to, I'm just not going to post anything. One of the things that is my least favorite aspect of Facebook, and and maybe yours too, is that I very often see people that I love dearly and worship with or have worshiped with with in 50 years of of life. I, I see them posting things where I just wish, please change your status to worshiping at the Baptist church or that you are a, a, a Methodist, or something else, because it, it, it hurts. Um, it, is, it is physically painful to see the people who have professed their love for Jesus in this post, two posts later, posting very surprising things, inappropriate things, wildly disconnected things. Um, We want to make sure that we are imitating Jesus as we seek to follow him. Following him is what we do. Our question always ought to be, is this something that Jesus would say? Is this something that Jesus would do? How would Jesus react to this post? Would Jesus post this thing that I think is a great idea or hilariously funny or whatever? The imitation of God, following in the footsteps of Jesus, is a fundamental part. It is the most basic part of being a Christ follower. We want to imitate Jesus' humility because God is revealed to us most clearly in the sacrifice that Jesus made for us himself. He laid down what was important to him for what was absolutely necessary for us. This is the clear example of forgiveness and love that we should follow. When we love others, we are a sacrifice that pleases God. That's what we read in Hebrews 13, 16. Jesus gives us an incredible example of God's grace to follow. We want to extend that. We want to follow in his footsteps. Something else that I think jumps out of this passage um, has to do, again, with exhortation. Paul gives us an exhortation to yield willingly to God's grace. Um, This whole thought in Ephesians 5 um, goes back to verse 21, where Paul writes about being filled with the Spirit. And then he describes ways that that Spirit filling is made evident and obvious. Speaking to one another with 
songs, hymns, and spiritual songs from the Spirit, singing and making music to the Lord, giving thanks to God for everything. And the last one is not quite so obvious because of a, a, a break in the text, but it, they're all connected together. The last one is being submissive. Being submissive is, is evidence that you are filled with God's Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, I believe it's uh, uh, Brother Lloyd-Jones um, that said that the only Christianity which is vibrant and exhilarating enough to penetrate and change society is that which manifests the power of the Spirit of God. Your lifestyle, your evidence of the Holy Spirit is what will bring change in the lives around you and ultimately in the world. Not your own power but the power of God's Holy Spirit coming through you. And we demonstrate that through songs and worship and thanksgiving and, and those things, but also in our submission, submitting, first of all, to, to God through Christ Jesus, but also submitting to others. Um, uh, one of the things that's true about submission is that it is something that is willingly chosen. No, I, I can choose to submit or not if I'm pulled over by an officer of the law. Um, I, I, can, I can be, um, be quiet and um, not argumentative. I can be respectful. I can be kind. Or I can be an absolute terror. I, I choose, though, willingly to submit to his authority. Um, our submission is due from us because of Christ Jesus, even though other people to whom we should submit don't deserve it. Well, my boss is a real idiot. I don't feel like I need to submit. My spouse is really, really awful and abusive. I don't think they. I need to... Okay, you're right. They are jerks. They are awful people. But... That's not the reason that you are submitting to somebody else. The reason you're submitting to somebody else is because you have already chosen to submit to Jesus. He's the boss, and you're not. And so you will do what he says. Now, um, there is in the, um, the text here the idea that the submission that we offer willingly is limited submission. Because we're told in other places that we're supposed to submit to the authorities over us. We're supposed to submit to the government, which most of us are happy to do until they require us to do something that is ungodly or immoral, directly in conflict with God's expressed will. And then we have to choose to obey him. We submit to him only. <clears throat> so here... In, in this passage that deals with um, submission in a family relationship, that same limit is there. We, we submit all the way up until it is contrary to the will of God. The submission is not the same thing as obedience. Obedience is commanded at the end of our passage for children. Kids, you have to obey your parents. That's been a, in the rules since the Ten Commands. It's um, uh, Paul says it's the first command with a promise. It's actually the only command with a promise there in the Ten Commandments. Children, oh, uh, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you in the land, that uh, you may prosper. Children need to obey. Wives don't need to obey. They willingly choose to yield to their husband's authority in the home. One of the results of the Spirit in our lives is that we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's what Paul says here in verse 21. And, and so we look to the needs of other people. Um, I, I have to think about that passage in Philippians 2, um, that, that beautiful passage. Um, 
really the first half of chapter 2 of Philippians about how Christ um, emptied himself of everything, that he took on the very nature of a servant, um, going all the way to death on a cross, uh, and that we need to have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to to be held on to, but he emptied himself. If Jesus is willing to empty himself and to submit to the will of God for the needs of other people, then we need to do the same, to submit to God by submitting to others. The the first example that Paul gives in that passage is submission in marriage, where Paul is not banging the drum about who's wearing the pants in the family. This is not about who's in charge. You know, the text doesn't say fathers demand absolute fear and obedience from your children, from your spouse. This is about responsibility. Wives have a responsibility in the home, which is different from the responsibility that fathers, husbands have, which is different from the responsibility that children have and parents Paul gives some very um, culturally common advice to the people um, here. Uh, When he speaks to women, he says something that every other writer would have said to any woman of the time. Submit to your husbands. But he makes it different by saying you need to submit to your husband the way that you would submit to Christ. And I... And, and that's really not much of a surprise. You know, he's saying something that anybody else would have heard, but he, um, he changes the, the reason for it, not because it's what culture says, but it's because what our Savior, Jesus, tells us. And then he, he turns his sights on husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's not as culturally common. Because husbands got to pretty much do whatever they wanted. They were married so they could have legitimate children to carry on their family name and their estate and um, their whatever inheritance they may be. But there were, they were also free to uh, visit temple prostitutes, um, to have other women on the side. That was not a big deal. Paul does not give that same freedom. Paul says, husbands, you need to love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is a radical idea. They are supposed to be making sacrifices for their wives. Now, not going to the temple and killing a bull and and offering it up on fire, but laying down the things that were most important to them. To choose to put their wives' needs, their, their wives' happiness and desires ahead of their own. Three times um, in in this text, Paul hits that drum hard. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. In his mind, submission and agape love, the kind of love that we have for one another, are synonymous. You, You cannot submit without that sort of sacrificial, unconditional love. And you, you cannot have unconditional love unless you are willing to submit to the needs and the desires of others. Now, I, I hope that you don't, don't believe that Paul is saying that wives should submit to their husbands in everything. That if he makes some outrageous request, you have to do it. That if he tells you to do something illegal or immoral, that you should do it. Again, the, the same standards apply. We, there is limited submission, limited only by what, um, what is consistent with God's will. Husbands, you have to love your wives. When you love your wife, it's not about what you're going to get out of it. The love that you show to your wife isn't based on appearance or worthiness. The love that we share in our family, the love that we have for our wives, guys, is based on that person's well-being, on nothing else. We love them, we sacrifice for them, 
because what they need is so important to us. Their happiness, their desires take precedence over our own. Whether we are male or female, by the time we get down through the rest of that passage, um, when we are filled with God's Holy Spirit, we will love and respect and submit to each other. Wives and husbands, children, friends, church. Uh, I think in the, uh, the passage as well that there's an expectation of gracious sacrifice. We've, we've talked about that. Just as Christ sacrificed himself to serve the church, men should sacri- make sacrifices to serve their wives. They should not do anything out of selfishness. But in humility, regard their wives as better than themselves, and the women should do the same. Again, this is the idea from Philippians chapter 2. Don't do anything out of vain conceit or selfish ambition. Put others before yourselves, especially in a marriage. Paul is calling for mutual respect and submission uh, here in in this passage and in other places uh, in his letters. The role of a husband is not to dominate the marriage and to rule with an iron fist, but instead to rule like Christ Jesus, who sacrificially loved, who served, who led lovingly. Husbands, your job is to love and to serve and to lead your wife and children. That means that you are intentionally and willingly looking out for their best interests. This would be a great thing for me to have or to get or to do. But what would this do to my family? Am I, am I uprooting them from their home, from their school, from family? Uh, is this going to have major ramifications long into the future for them? What would be the best for my wife and children? See, the kind of love that Jesus has for us and the kind of love that we're supposed to have for others is about laying down our own issues and concerns for the benefit of other people. I don't know how, uh, how many more times or how, how more, much more strongly I can say that, but it's something that is very easy to forget in a family. We're great with being sweet to people at church um, when, when we're wearing our church T-shirt and we're handing out water bottles or uh, you know, handing out candy or something like that. We are gracious and sweet and kind, but it's the people that we live with that we treat the worst. God's grace ought to be practiced at home polished up at home so it can be presented well to everybody outside our home. Man, you have one supreme duty, to love your wife as yourself, Paul says. Um, Just one woman doing everything for her physical needs, emotional needs, mental needs, social and spiritual needs. We want her to be healthy in every possible way. Men, your question should be, what does my wife need? Followed quickly after with, what does my family need? And then choosing to make sacrifices to make that happen. Because when we do all that, I, I believe what Paul tells us is that we will experience transforming grace. Like I said, it's, it's very easy to make everything about ourselves. It's our time our conversations about topics that we want to discuss with the people that we want to talk to. It's all about our expectations. We can be extraordinarily selfish, but and without the power of God's grace, that selfishness will kill a marriage. It will kill a family. We need instead to kill that selfishness with God's grace so that we can love our spouses and children in a way that honors God and changes us. Now, grace really is very opposed to selfishness. Um, Grace is about God's unmerited favor. 
Selfishness is all about, I have merit. Everybody else should recognize it. I should be getting this because of who I am, because of what I've done. They could not be more different, grace and, and selfishness. I think what we need to keep in mind is that we understand that Jesus loved the church, but Jesus didn't love the church because it was perfectly lovable. You all are a disaster. Continuing, swirling disasters, right? We got all kinds of issues and crises going on, all these um, temptations and, and failures and sin that, that you just cannot leave alone. But guess what? God still loves you. He still gives you his blessing and his grace. It's not because you are lovable that God loves you. God shows us grace. Jesus loves the church in order to make it lovable. We're all being changed. We're all being transformed. The more, the more of his love that gets into our lives, gets into our hearts, gets into our experience, the, the more we become like him. God's grace changes us. And God's grace will absolutely change marriages and families. The last part of the text here uh, is directed to fathers, or it could be to parents in general. Um, parents, don't exasperate your children. Don't wear them out as you try to bring them up. Don't, don't beat them down and, and frustrate them. Instead, the, the plan is to nurture them and to be supportive. Sometimes that's really hard to do. Because sometimes what it feels like really is needed is the swift hand of absolute justice. But we need to remember that we are to extend God's grace to our children, to our grandchildren, to our spouse. That grace ought to play in every direction under our roof. And when a husband and a wife when their, when their greatest desire is to better each other, when the wife's greatest desire is to support her husband's leadership spiritually in the home, when the husband's greatest desire is the, the happiness of his wife, her blessing, then there is a harmonious, beautiful, successful union struck there. If things are not great in your marriage, you both might need to try extending God's grace to each other. Because we have experienced God's grace, we are ready to share it with those who are closest to us. I, 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 those are the people who make us the most crazy. They can be the most frustrating. They're the ones who make us the angriest, the quickest. But we need to make sure that as followers of Jesus, that those people are getting the first hand helping, the first big hand of grace from us, not those who get the leftovers and the scraps. Because we've experienced His grace, we must be ready to share that grace with our, with our families with our spouse, with our children, with our parents. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would help us to realize what this is going to mean for us through the rest of the afternoon, through this week, the rest of the month, through the summer. Lord, what will it mean for us to extend your grace to the people with whom we share a home and family? Lord, we, we pray that the way that we treat others in our home would be an incredible testimony of the grace that we've received from you and the grace that is available to everybody else around us. Lord, we pray that um, the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives would be demonstrated by the way we treat those we love the most. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.
I'll ask um, four men to come right now uh, to begin serving the congregation as we get ready for the Lord's Supper. If you're watching from home, uh, you may uh, want to make sure that you have uh, those elements ready so you can partake with us here in just a few moments. <clears throat> Uh, as, as has been mentioned here um, already today, um, 20 years ago today, I came to Utah um, as a 52-year-old man. Um, that means I've spent a, a good deal of my adult life here, um, but, but not all of it. Um, in, in those 52 years, uh, I figured out that I've, I've been alive for something like 2,700 Sundays. Once I became a Christian at, at the age of 12, I began observing the Lord's Supper. Again, I, I did some math and figured out that that's more than 2,000 times I have partaken of communion. Some of those Moments have been incredibly memorable, never, never forgotten. Um, some of those moments have been more routine. None of them have been without meaning. Each week we have moments um, that are an opportunity to reflect on the person that we have been, how we have walked with Jesus, what we have needed most from him, as well as our gratitude for his totally uncalled for but eternity-changing salvation and grace. Let's make sure that we take some, some time this morning to, to reflect on those things, to remember how good he has been to us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so very much uh, for the incredible love that you have shown to us, for your willingness to forgive not just a day's worth of sin or a week's worth of sin, but an entire lifetime of absolute disobedient rebellion. Father, we're grateful um, that your love allows you to see us as we can be. And we pray, Lord, that um, through communion this morning, through our time together, um, through our study of your word and worship, that you would change us every single day to become more and more like your son. Help us to say what he would say, to do what he would do. Thank you, Father, for your incredible sacrifice on our behalf. Through Christ we pray, amen. <clears throat> In the Gospels, the account of the Last Supper shows us that Jesus took bread uh, during the meal, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he, had, he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> Amen. Uh, I'm glad we could be together today. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I have been instructed to stop talking um, and to move over so somebody else can. morning that James preached the sermon that he preached. And I'm sure that he was serious when he said he was going to be very careful because he wanted to enjoy another 20 years at Roy Christian Church. But if he was honest with you, he would probably have told you that what would be more important than 20 years at Roy Christian Church would be another 18 years married to Stacy. In 1992, 
James graduated from Johnson Bible College in Knoxville, Tennessee. And for the next 10 years, he served the Lord at the First Christian Church in Francisville, Indiana. He served in the children's ministry. He served in the youth ministry and has had responsibilities as associate pastor. And from all we could tell when we interviewed him, he did a fabulous job. But it was time for him to have a change. And so on March 12th, 2002, he submitted his full application to Roy Christian Church. After the elders reviewed that application, they invited him out for an interview. He was later offered the job, and on June 26, 2002, he showed up, as he said, with the Penske moving truck. And his life will never, would never be the same. Shortly after he got here, him and I had a conversation, and he shared with me that he was felt destined to serve the Lord as the Apostle Paul did as a bachelor. He did not ever think that God would bless him with a partner in ministry. Oh, so remember that in Indiana, there are 500 churches just like this one. So after 10 years in ministry in Indiana and four years of Johnson Bible College, um, I came single. There was no way for it to happen in Utah where there were four churches. It was on a horseback trip in the San Rafael River Swell that James approached me and asked permission as an elder for him to pursue what he hoped to be his partner in ministry. I, of course, gave him my full blessings. And on September 4th, 2004, James's life changed forever as did Stacy's. And for the past 18 years, they have served the Lord famously. And they have impacted lives that they probably don't even know. And the joy that this congregation has in watching these two serve the Lord is just beyond imagination. And so, in addition to the potluck that we are going to have following the service, we have a certificate of appreciation for those 20 years that we would like to present to them. But before I present them this certificate of appreciation, I would like to read it. In appreciation of 20 years of service, the family, friends, and members of Roy Christian Church proudly present the following package to James and Stacy Sayers. Such package to include round trip airfare to Tel Aviv, Israel, with a two to three day layover in Rome, Italy, full accommodations in Rome. The Best of Israel Service First Class 12-Day Tour of sites to include Caesarea, Philippi, Bethsaida, the Jordan River, the Mount of Beatitudes, the Sea of Galilee, the Dome of the Rock, the Garden Tomb, the Dead Sea, Masada, and Gedi, Jerusalem, the Holocaust Museum, the Via Della Rosa, the Wailing Wall, and Bethlehem. All expenses paid. And I'm not, I can't be more proud of this couple and of this church who showed their love and admiration. And we do look forward to 20 more years. <laughs> 